very excited for today's guest. I first met Sally Fisher 40 years ago. I was a new film critic at the Wall Street Journal, and Sally was working for Lois Smith, a legendary publicist whose clients included Meryl Streep and Robert Redford, William Hurt, and Keanu Reeves, among many, many others. Sally was tiny, but very intimidating. She was a born and bred Manhattanite who seemed to know everything about anything that mattered. I'd grown up in rural Ohio and spent the first five years of my journalism career as a banking and commodities reporter. There was a lot to learn. And Sally was an important guide. She was a total professional who knew when to push and when to pull back. We became friends and I watched her start her own business and expand her customer base way beyond Hollywood, representing major Italian brands like Benetton, important architecture firms like David Rockwell, and even becoming an Italian knight. We'll talk about that. Even throughout all that, she remained publicist for Jeremy Irons to this day, as well as Sting and Trudy. I have many questions for her about her life and work and urge you to put yours into the chat. It's a delight to welcome Sally Fisher to At Lunch. Welcome, Sally. Hi, Julie. Hello, everybody. So nice to be here with you today. Great. So nice. <laughs> you go. <laughs> what an intro. What can I say? Well, all true. So Sally, as you know better than any way, anyone publicists usually work behind the scenes, but it was hard not to notice at this year's Oscars that publicists seem to replace agents for the big shout out. Um, do you think it was just a fluke or what do you make of that? You know, I apologize to everybody in advance because I had actually placed in the chat and I guess when you record, you can't, I don't know what it is, but there's an article that came out in the Hollywood Reporter about that. And I, I, I had given you the link to see it, but everybody should open it up. Also, in 1990, Jeremy Irons received the Academy Award for Best Actor in a Role in Reversal of Fortune. And I sat in the audience. We, I was sitting next to him. And in fact, I had the clip from YouTube for you to watch that as well. And lo and behold, unbeknownst to me, he thanked me. And he didn't refer to me as his publicist. He just thanked a list of people and I was among them. And I have to tell you, it was really one of the highlights of my life. I mean, there have been many, but that was certainly one of them. So if you want to see that great night where Jeremy gets up after he's Jessica Tandy announces that he's won the Academy Award for Best Actor and see him kiss me and see him thank me, watch it as many times as you want. It still delights me every time. But to that point, Julie, it it I remember people saying to me at the time, and this is decades ago, oh my God, nobody ever thanks their publicists. It's, you know, we're known as the unsung heroes. And honestly, even today, when you, you know, said to me, gee, I'd love to tell everybody about what PR and publicity publicity is all about. Would you join me on, you know, my chats at lunch? I thought, you know, I don't do that. I'm supposed to be in the background. You know, publicists are not meant to promote themselves. They're meant to promote their clients. So I, first and foremost, have always been someone who have, you know, I've always sort of said, you know, them first, it's not about me, but isn't it great to be thanked? And so lovely that this particular Academy Award that people sort of went on a real string of events where one after the other thanked their publicists. And Robert Downey Jr. did as well, by the way. He thanked his stylist too, which I found delightful. I mean, who thanks their wife, their stylist, their stylist and their publicist all in one night? Yeah, no, it, it was great. And so um, that kind of leads me to my next question, because um, as somebody who's a book author, and I'm sure I've done this myself, you know, if things don't work out the way you want them to, a lot of times the first thing the creators do is they blame the publicist. Ah, I didn't have good publicity. If I'd have better publicity, it would have done better. But I don't know if that always happens in reverse when something works out. Um to your point about credit, I'm not sure that people typically have 
um, given credit to their publicists for the fact that their work has reached a wide audience. But I think for most people, the whole notion of public relations is a little, except for the professionals who have tuned in today, and I saw you signed up, but could you just sort of give PR 101? I mean, what does it even mean? Sure. Well, first to address your first point about, you know, publicity can be bad and we're often blamed. You know, let's say somebody's book comes out or, or you've directed a movie or you've written a song and your album has come out. And, you know, whatever it may be, the medium that you work in, that is so important to you. You've worked two years at least on that. And then a film comes out in my day, you know, Vincent Canby, I would pick up the telephone and I would call him personally and say, Vincent, because I called him Vincent, could you please, if I knew he reviewed a film well, could you please write a feature? It would just help Birdie. That was an Alan Parker film that oh, I wrote. Yeah. And I recall that he said, I love that film. I knew that he did because he'd reviewed it. And I said, it would help us so much if, if you could write a feature. And lo and behold, the arts and leisure section would have a piece on Birdie, you know, three Sundays from then. And it took a lot of chutzpah to do that. I know that. But, you know, if you work in PR, you have to feel extraordinarily strong and passionately about what you're doing. If you don't, don't do it. It's so detailed oriented. It's very focus oriented. You have to care. You have to be curious. If you don't, PR is not for you. So when I meet with a potential client, first of all, I have to know that I care. And Julie, I believe in one of your books, I cared so much that I said, you've got to do a book party for this book. It's important. So I went out, found a location, set it up. And you know, you were shy in that case and you weren't sure you wanted to do that. And it worked out well. And I'm so glad I did. So what I'm trying to say is that if you're passionate about something, I will then tell any client, you know, they're gonna, I'm going to tell them, what are your expectations? And they're going to say to me, well, I want a Wall Street Journal piece. I want a New York Times piece. And I'm going to right up front tell them what their potentials are. I'm going to say to them, you know, I'm so glad you're telling me this. I do think that we potentially could get a Times piece, but sometimes I say, gee, I really don't think it's it's going to get a Wall Street Journal piece. And they'll say to me, well, I can't hire you. And I'll say, thank you. I'm so glad because I want, I'm going to tell you right up front that it's not going to happen. And then if it happens, all the better. So I think that it's expectations, but I think PR, public relations is relating to the public. It's bringing the public in via the press, via the consumers creating events. And also, of course, the wonderful social media. I mean, today, you know, I, I wanted to prove my point. So I invited many guests that I know. You know, my friends from high school may be online today with us. <laughs> my my family, my friends from all walks of life. And it's my pleasure to have them see me and my pleasure to think of them as I ramble, you know, off my questions and answers. But I have to say that I've always been somebody who has cared enormously about people and things. Well, that I that I know for sure. And as uh, having been the recipient of that, I was I even said uh, on Facebook when I was sharing one of your posts, I said I've never had one of these at lunches so well publicized as having you as a guest. What a surprise! Um, you know, just sort of following up on that, is there any occasion that stands out in your mind when things just really didn't go the way you thought? Or what? Or let me put it in a more general way, if you don't want to call out any particular person, but but has there been a time when you felt really frustrated because a journalist sort of led you on, or you thought something was going to happen and it turned out to be quite different no, from I'll what you, you thought? That. I'll tell you that I, years ago, this goes back years. Um, I was promoting somebody who's very near and dear to the royal family. And she had a lovely, wonderful book and has a whole lifestyle um, uh, set of books. And I thought she was a delight. And, you know, I don't know that much about that end of the world. I knew a lot about, you know, the book, the beautiful photographs. And I was able to get an arts and leisure piece and the story was basically a negative story about her. And the journalist never let on to me. And it, it hurt my feelings 
because I guess you always think, well, where did I fall flat? You know, because I really thought she, you know, I allowed her to interview the person um, and I never ever imagined, but that's that was my naivete. And I learned a lesson there, um, you know, that I needed to be more substantially involved and understand that it's possible to do a real negative piece and I wouldn't even know it. And, you know, it, 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 it hurt my feelings. I learned a lesson. I am more careful. This goes back probably 20 years, but you never know. You never know, do you? But I can tell you something else on the other flip, the other side of the coin. I recently had an amazing experience with a photographer named Priscilla Ratazzi. She's an amazing photographer. She had photographed the hoodoos of the Dakotas. And um, I found it a remarkable uh, photo exhibition that was uh, featured at Staley Wise. And it was right at the beginning of, you know, the, the, the first outcome of COVID. So 2020 September, when we first all ventured outside of our homes in that autumn. And um, I promoted her exhibit and unbeknownst to me, the New York Times said, I delivered the book to them. I delivered it to their homes. I got it there. And they said they wanted to do something on it. But what the unbeknownst to me was, is that it ended up on the cover of the New York Times because it oh, was- wow. It was an anti-Trump statement somehow or another, and it was very timely to the elections, which were coming up in November. So I can tell you that lots of times I'm bewildered betwixt and between, but in the end, it is what it is. You can't maneuver everything. Absolutely. Um, in life as in NPR, I should say. So I uh, guess I have to ask you, how did you decide to be put? Were you in seventh grade publicizing the school dance or <laughs> was this something you were born I to guess do? My, my, just... my, my gal pals who were from high school are probably all smiling now and they'll remember. Yeah, somebody, Carolyn Brooks says hello. Yeah, <laughs> so. yeah. Thank you for uh, I, I'm not looking at the chat because no, I, no, you shouldn't. But, um, but, but I, I, I have seriously, how did you get into the field? So in high school, I don't know if anybody remembers that once upon a time there were phone numbers. So and they didn't start with 212 or 516. So in high school, I already knew that the New York Times, the New York Times phone number was 556-1234. And I used to call the Times and tell them that the Calhoun School Bazaar, which is where I happily went to high school. Um, <laughs> we were 32 girls in a class of uh, graduates. And it was so fantastic to go to an all girls school in Manhattan in the 1970s. And I loved every one of my classmates. Well, I didn't, but I wish I did. And um, I, we, I was made social activities chairperson in 10th grade, which meant that I organized the school prom I organized all the school activities. And so I think that that was PR then, you know, I'd call the times and I'd have our bazaar listed as a charity event. I'd get on the phone, you know, you can't even call the New York times today. You can, but it's a recording. So times have changed. Yes. I knew I publicity and PR were for me. I didn't call it that. I called it social activities chairman, but, uh, chairperson, <laughs> but I went on to organize, uh, school dances, yes, but also then when I moved to Italy, which I know, you know, we'll probably get into, you know, I, I then organized a summer camp for children in Florence, American, Italian, all denominations. And I just wanted to say this, that I became a school teacher. Um, that was my first job. When I came back to New York, I um, went to Montessori and did teacher training. And being in publicity and being a PR person, is very much like babysitting, teaching, and working for any client you can work with because you have to care about them. You have to take care of them. I recently attended a um, honor, uh, an award ceremony for David Rockwell. He was receiving an award for uh, being a great uh, set designer and architect. Um, it was really a thrill for me to be um, a part of it, but also just to be, have done PR for David um, along the way in his early to mid years. And I learned about architecture, I learned about design, I learned about set design. 
and David uh, was right in front of me and I was talking to Andre De Shields, who had won the Academy, the Tony Award for um, his role in um, uh, Hades Town. And I love Andre. I think he's a fabulous actor. He's a beautiful man. And I saw David sort of lurking near me and I thought, oh my God, I wonder if David and Andre know one another. So I wasn't his publicist, it wasn't my job, but I said, Andre, do you know David Rockwell? And I called David over and said, David, you have to come in. And he said, oh, it's so great to meet you, Andre. I email you all the time. Isn't it fabulous to just get to talk to you in person? And for the next 10 minutes, you know, they were off talking to one another. And it made me feel really good because that's what it's all about. Introducing people, letting them know one another, and David means so much to me, and so do Andre, so I'm glad they're now friends. That's great. I love that. I love Andre De Shields also. So Maybe. I was just about to ask you a question about the change in the business you alluded earlier to social media, but um, somebody from the audience, Shelley Poloni, has written a very good question saying, how do you think social media has impacted PR, and how do you or can you address disinformation? You know, disinformation is really something tough. I can't address it because I see that it's happening so often. And I guess that, you know, I don't even want to bring it up, but somebody announced, you know, and it looked real that our dear, you know, King Charles had passed away and it wasn't true. And I mean, God forbid that somebody would have the bad taste to even think to do that. So disinformation is just a, God awful thing that I could name um, a person directly who I think started doing that, but I'm going to stay away from politics. But so how has the business changed? The business has changed um, so much because I use social media to our advantage. I mean, I was able to post on Facebook that, um, you know, I was having this chat with Julie. I was able to understand that a net in store recently had a chat with you because you posted it on yours and so did Annette in store. And I was so happy to join for that ch chat. Um, I also, you know, I'm often posting uh, wonderful items. We were Sally Fisher PR and I have a uh, Instagram account where every day right now we're posting important women for Italian, for uh, Women's History Month. Um, so they're Italian because I care about Italy a lot. And, you know, I think that social media has changed my life as a publicist to the better because I believe that I'm able to promote things that I believe in. I also promote the fact that my husband and my son and I go to theater. We post our pictures with our playbills. And why do we do that? Not only because we're out and having a good time, but we need to get back to going out to theater and to the movies again. It's so important to support the arts. What are we doing? You know, the arts, nobody goes out anymore. Nobody goes to the theater. Everybody's looking, streaming films. We need to see movies at the theater, on the screens. We need to go to the theater, support our local, you know, Broadway theaters, off-Broadway. I recently saw Appropriate. I recently saw Jonah. I recently saw, I'm seeing O'Mary. Can't wait to see it. I mean, golly, we need to support the arts. So, in the way that I can support them on social media, I'm also oh happy to do that. Disinformation, go out and vote when the elections come so that we have the perfect person who doesn't disinform and who does not lie, tell us the truth so that we can believe in what we're hearing. Well, that's great. Although I will say we've been going to a lot of theater also for the last couple of years and things seem packed now, which is kind of great. They are. They are and they aren't. They are and they aren't. Well, that's interesting. So um, you've alluded to Italy. Italy is so much a part of your life. You have a book there from Rome. I mean, when I think of you, I think of you as almost a binational. You know, you've spent so much time in Italy, but I also think of you literally as the consummate New Yorker. So if you could just, I think you're Italy origin story is so interesting and somewhat unlikely or maybe very likely, but if you could tell everybody how you even got to be, uh, to make Italy so much a part, not just of your life, but your work. Of course, I'm happy to do that. I mean, it may take, you know, a minute for everybody to sort of, 
But when I was 13, my mom took me and a girlfriend to Italy and we did a tour for six weeks. Believe it or not, she did that so that we wouldn't go to Woodstock, which I think is so funny, you know, that she would think that out of the box. So I didn't get to Woodstock, but I did get to Lake Como, which was absolutely beautiful. And, um, you know, after that, when I was 16, out of Calhoun, we went on an art history tour with our art history teacher. And he took 16 girls over Easter and we arrived this coming Sunday, Palm Sunday in Florence. We got off the train, 16 girls all dressed up like Madeline. And we went to our little pension. And when we arrived, we found out that the museums and were all on strike. So there we were <laughs> in Florence, not able to see the Uffizi, not able to go into any of the private museums. And we were set loose to love Florence. And we did. And I became very involved in Florence, as did all of my girlfriends. Carolyn is one of them. Uh, Debbie Kate is another. Karen is another. We were all there in Florence and we had a wonderful, wonderful time. And I came to know the city better. And I thought to myself, gee whiz, this is really a great city. Now, if you guys can all imagine for a moment that famous New Yorker uh, illustration where you have New York and then you have the rest of the world. Well, if you can imagine that with New York, Florence, and the rest of the world with the Arno River and the Hudson River, that's my world. I've lived in two cities. I've lived on a grid in New York. Florence, I had to learn the streets because it was zigzagging crazy, but put me on a highway, I have no idea where I am. So that's just to say I'm extremely provincial. Yes, I am a New Yorker but I believe New York is the center of the world. If there's another center of the world, it's Florence. And I lived in Florence starting as a 17 year old. I did a junior, after our junior year in high school, I did a senior exchange program from Calhoun. I did an independent study. I was a sort of guinea pig. I don't know anybody else who did it in, at my age in those years, but they were rebellious, difficult times. What can I say? The Vietnam War was waging, raging. And uh, I was uh, in Florence and really felt that it was a safe, wonderful environment to be in. I was learning another language, another culture. And I stayed for eight years. I didn't come home till I was 24 years old. And I started a summer camp there. I started teaching um, children English as a second language. I became a teacher at the American School of Florence. I did university there. I finished the Universita di Firenze. I'm absolutely fluent in both languages. I read and speak and write in both languages, not to the best of um, anybody's ability, but to the best of mine, because I did it twice and at the age where you'd think that you were sort of perfecting your English. So as a result, neither are perfect. Um, I have to say that Italy has been instrumental in my life. It's given me a wonderful career. It's given me a niche in PR. And when I came back in the 1980s, <clears throat> I felt that I was able to promote and work with Italian clients. Um, one of my first jobs was to work at Reed Soli, not the bookstore, but above the bookstore and work on their magazines. And from there, you know, I continued to network and know people. And I think, you know, Julie, we met soon thereafter when I went to work for Lois Smith and Peggy Siegel. And you'd be, um, you'd smile to know that one of the reasons why Lois and Peggy, um, and it was Peggy Siegel, um, Lois sadly has passed away, but Peggy is very much alive and living in New York. And Peggy and Lois both wanted me because they felt that I was knowledgeable about European film and the arts. And so we started out working with Orion Classics, Sony Classics on their European films. And it then sort of ballooned into working on Hollywood films. And you and I had the pleasure to meet one another when I worked on Beverly Hills Cop and, um, you know, worked with Eddie Murphy and then with Bill Murray and then with Bill Hurt and so many other wonderful celebrities. It was also the moment that I met Jeremy Irons because he was starring on Broadway in The Real Thing, and um, his film, L'Amour du Swan, um, Swan in Love, was um, the film that he starred in. Jeremy won the Tony that year for The Real Thing on Broadway, and I began to work with him. 
I promoted Swan in Love, which featured Ornella Muti and famous Italian star. And Jeremy said, hey, can you continue to work with me after Swan in Love is my personal publicist? And I did, and that was 40 years ago. That is amazing. It's such a great story. Um, and so with the Italian connection, um, you know, this is the American Jewish Historical Society, and we always want to talk to people about their Jewish identity. And I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about your Jewish identity before you became semi-Italian, and if the experience of spending so much time in Italy changed it at all. Do you know, I think that it totally did change it um, in that I grew up in Manhattan. I was part of uh, the Park Avenue Synagogue. My brother was bar mitzvahed there at that time. Women, you know, girls weren't necessarily bat mitzvahed. I totally uh, didn't care. I enjoyed my Jewish uh, uh, religious school um, learning and that was sort of it, but I was confirmed to Cherry Tefilla. Um, I believed in, in going to synagogue for the high holy days. My grandparents were very religious. They were mm. born in Europe. Both sets of my grandparents were, um, except actually my grandmother on my mother's side was born in Pennsylvania, but you know, of all migrants, obviously all immigrants. And um, I, I went to Italy as a Jew and, you know, what can I say? You know, Italy, I think there are 3,000 Jews in all of Italy today. And um, I, I, Italy is, you know, definitely not a, um, a country that welcomes, I, I'm going to say that, you know, right up front, other um, minorities uh, open, you know, with open doors. I mean, I can't say that I experienced personally any anti-Semitism, although, you know, when I moved into my own apartment, I was told that it was probably better not to put the mezuzah up on my door that I was going to put up because they felt it would be, it would bring, you know, bad luck to me, which I had never heard that before, you know, and, and also remember that the Vietnam War, anti-Nixon, anti-Americanism, anti-everything, but adding to it, Jew, being Jewish, I mean, I was sort of a target. Um, but that said, I never experienced any, any, anything other than people making comments that, you know, oh, well, I've never met a Jew. I actually met a Texan in Florence during those years who said to me, I've never met anybody Jewish. And I thought, okay, well, so do we have foreigns? I mean, it was just ridiculous, you know, the things that people would say. But I was glad to have the experience to be a woman, Jewish person, living in a separate country and realizing that my identity as a New Yorker was so different from being in Italy and being an American and being a Jew. And this was a, a very awakening, a huge awakening to me because for the first time I was exposed to Americans and not New Yorkers and Italians and obviously the whole world. So I realized that New York was not the do all end all and that people didn't really, weren't all the same. I came to Italy not realizing the hot water didn't come out of, you know, the pipes naturally. I, I when, you know, my hot water heater ended, I said, well, where's the hot water? And they said, well, you have to turn on your hot water heater. And I said, what's that? I had no idea living in New York where there are boilers down in the basement. You know, I was very naive. So I woke up quickly in Italy. Well, and I was wondering, because you you also made friends there uh, with Italians who were Jewish, whose historical frame of reference, I would think, would be quite different, even in terms of the Holocaust or yes. just the different sensibility. And I was wondering if that was something that affected you directly or was just in the background or what? I think so. so Florence has, you know, a population of probably a thousand Jews. And I had a photography store right on my block that was the Levi photo store. And um, the synagogue, the great synagogue of Florence was right in the middle of Florence. I posted a beautiful photograph, which I'm so sorry you can't see, of the beautiful green dome that is the uh, Florentine synagogue. And I beg you all to go and take a look at it if you haven't visited it personally. I went and taught there um, 
after I graduated from college in the afternoons, I did an after school program. And it, it was so fantastic to be part of the synagogue in Florence, which is so, you know, it dates back to the 1800s. Now, you know, of course, you realize when you're in Florence and when you're in Italy that these places were all bombed and, you know, had all been restructured several times. You know, during war, World War II, there, you know, that happened. And of course, during COVID again, the synagogue closed. But I have to say, when I was there and I taught there, there was free admission to the synagogue. You could come and go. And then now as visitors, you have to buy a ticket to the museum in any synagogue in Italy. And then you go to visit the synagogue and it has to be a planned visit. You know, and I understand this, but it's not the same. You know, the world is- Because of security, because of security considerations. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, it's really quite heartbreaking, really. Well, then just to reverse the question a little bit, did your time in Italy change the way you thought about New York? Because you've gone back and forth so much, you became semi-Italian. What was it like revisiting this city that you thought was the only place in the universe after having found out there was at least one other place? Well, I realized that I'm, you know, just a speck on the earth, that's for sure. I never would. I was so happy when my son um, went to school here in New York City, when the first thing that Fieldston teaches the kids way, you know, in pre-K, and it goes all the way through the elementary school, is that first there's the world, then there's the United States that's in the world, then you're in New York, in the world, in the United States and then New York, and then you're there too. So you're just a little speck, a part of this whole world. And it's so important for us all to understand the community, that we're parts of many communities. But one of the things that I did, and I'll go back to my Jewish identity, and I'm so thankful to Andrea Fiano and the whole Jewish New York Italian community for there's a Jew a Holocaust Remembrance Day in I think it's January 25th, but it fall it, I think it it falls on the on a Monday rather than the same day every it's the Remembrance Day, and the Consul General in New York every year outside of the consulate um, respects this day and has invites people to come and read the names of the dead, and I've done it for years and um, this year and I had posted a photograph of it. Unfortunately, it, you know my photographs didn't appear. But, you know, that's one of the things we were talking about. Is anything disappointing? Well, you know, whatever your presentations aren't always the way that you hope that they would be. But it's fantastic. You you know, it it, it brings me together with my Jewish Italian friends, but also it opened. It's right there on Park Avenue, 68th Street, the consulate. And there you are reading names and people pass by and, you know, it's something special. Yeah, yeah, very much so. Um, so. This brings me to the question. I think it also took place on Park Avenue when you became a knight <laughs> of Italy. So um, I didn't even know Italy had knights. I thought they were just King Arthur and the knights. And tell people how that came came to be because it was I was there that day. It was an incredible event. It was a beautiful uh, event. And again, I had photographs, but again, I'm sad to say that they're not there. But um, what? what the Genuardi who was our consul general in New York and um, consul general Fabrizio Di Michele again now, you know, there's this wonderful um, award ceremony that goes on year after year where the president of Italy, and in my case, it was president Mattarella who honored me with a Stella of Italy. And, you know, it's this wonderful ceremony where you're honored for the work that you do in the United States to help bring together a bridge between the United States and Italy. And my whole family was there and it was just beautiful. Even my cousins and friends and you and Bill were there. And I have to say it was it was a beautiful day that I'll remember forever. And, you know, it goes along with those moments that we talked about in the beginning, the Academy Award, where I was, you know, mentioned by Jeremy that you just know that you're making your family proud and your friends proud and everything you do to work hard every day as a woman and as a mother and as a wife and as a member of a family and as a friend as being, you know, acknowledged and acknowledgement helps you go on. Well, and that brings me to another very important aspect of your career, which is 
that you started your own business. And, you know, at the time um, you started that business as a woman entrepreneur, that was not as common as it is today, surely. And I was wondering, how did you make the decision to go off on your own? And how did you make that decision? And what was the what was the hardest part of it? And what's the most rewarding part of it? I didn't really decide to be fair. I didn't really decide to go off on my own just like that. I mean, I came back to the United States and, you know, I was very upset, frankly, to be to be back in New York at first. Um, it was very hard. I'd lived abroad for eight years. Um, I was very entrenched in Italian life for all goods and you know rights and purposes. I could have stayed there. But, you know, I was 24 and I realized that, you know, hey, what might happen? I might, you know, meet somebody and get married. And I really didn't want to spend the rest of my life in Italy necessarily. I wanted to give New York a chance again. I'd come home and I'd, you know, my brother had worked for, you know, Lemmings and Lemmings was this wonderful show off Broadway that John Belushi and that um, uh, Chris Guest and, uh, Paul Jacobs and, you know, Bill um, had been involved in and, you know, it went on to be Saturday Night Live like and, you know, I'd come home and I'd be involved with all of this and I would think, oh my God, New York is so much fun. I've got to go back. I've got to go back. And, you know, I just never made it home because I was so involved in Florentine life. So two years of life here, um, it took me to get back into being in New York. And thanks to a lot of my friends who you know, you come back as a guest and you're, you know, you're fed it every day. Everybody loves you, but you come back to live here and it's like, okay, we, we know you're here. Good to see you. You have to sort of find your way. And I did. And I, my first job, as I was explaining to you, was at Rizzoli. And from there, you know, I went on to work at Smith and Siegel. Um, and when I was at Smith and Siegel, um, I continued to be, you know, beckoned by Italian companies. And so Benetton approached me. And Benetton at the time was huge in Europe and not so huge in the United States. It was just starting to be big. And Luciano Benetton, who was the um, one of four brothers and one sister, three brothers and one sister, called me and asked me if I would join he knew that I spoke Italian and English. The brothers at the time did not speak English and they felt it would be instrumental to have a person here in the United States promoting um, the Benetton brand, going to the stores around the country, getting to meet people, uh, um, be out there and you know get be the spokesperson for the brand, travel with the family. And you know this was really a phenomenal experience for me. I remember when I went to Lois and Peggy at Smith and Siegel to tell them that I was sadly leaving. And by the way, I had a replacement for myself. Marcy Bloom came in and replaced me, which, you know, she went on to do wonderful things um, one, uh, after having, uh, uh, you know, left her job at, uh, in the film industry. Um, I have to say that uh, it was difficult for me to leave Smith and Siegel and the, the movie business per se, but I went on to promote and do business PR, fashion PR, celebrity PR. Um, all of these elements were involved, fashion PR with Benetton. It was about a family and being in house at a company is really important. You know, I had done agency work and now I was in house at a company and experiencing both. You kind of say to yourself, gee, aren't I lucky? I get to sort of see what it's like in-house. And when I get to see it in an agency, well, what's it like at an agency? Well, an agency, you get to pretty much do what you want. I mean, we're a bunch of mostly women, you know, because let's face it, I don't know what the percentages are. I could have found out, but I, I'm going to guess that it's not 50-50. And you, you know, you're sitting around, you know, shooting the breeze with all these women all day laughing and explaining, you know, how can we get Julie Salomon of the Wall Street Journal or of the New York Times to do a story? And, you know, then you go into, oh, well, you know, uh, how can I get 
um, Jeremy Irons on the cover of GQ magazine. And, you know, then you go to Benetton and you're talking about, well, gee, how can I promote, you know, the, the new line of 012 children's wear of Benetton? Or how can I get Benetton in, in the business section of the Wall Street Journal um, in a good way? Because they're all of a sudden the talk of the town. And remember, gaps were on every corner. Starbucks didn't exist yet. You know, Benetton started to be on every corner. I traveled to Texas, to Atlanta, to Florida, to Michigan, to, and, you know, I was all over the United States. I came to know the United States through Benetton. So I really feel that that job gave me an in to understanding the United States better. Because again, New York is not, is really a vacuum. Thank God. In lots of ways. <laughs> but Benetton gave me a real opportunity to work in-house. And, you know, after five years at Benetton, business started to really go down. Because why? Because they had overreacted in the United States mm -hmm. and really, um, you know, sort of overwhelmingly present. So the people... Um, started to complain and say, you know, there's Benetton in every corner and the owners started to compete with one another. And, you know, there were lots of things that happened. And so the Benetton family came to me and they said, you know, we're going to have to shrink and we'd love for you to stay and be a part of it. But if you'd like, um, we're going to, um, Luciano Benetton went on to do a book about his life and his biography and Doubleday Bantam um, uh, were the publishers. And Luciano asked if I would come and work on the book with him. And I did. And they gave me a wonderful situation and they set me up in my own business. Um, and I decided I would try it for a year. And if I liked it, great. But, you know, I really didn't think I was going on to do my, my own business. I was, you know, working out of my home, which was, again, this was pre-COVID, you know, and I said, gee, let's see how it goes. If it goes well, terrific. <laughs> doesn't go well, you know, I'll go back into a company or go back to an agency. And I loved it. One of my first, you'll be, um, one of my first clients was actually uh, the Jewish Museum of New York when Joan Rosenbaum was, was right. there. And we promoted a, the uh, ghettos of Italy and the Jewish, the Jewish ghettos of Italy and the art of the Jewish ghettos of Italy. It was one of the most beautiful exhibits ever at the Jewish Museum. And I brought the film, The Garden of the Finzi Cantini, to the, the museum. And we did a, a wonderful preview. And we opened the exhibit that way um, by showing the film. Manuel de Sica, the son of Vittorio de Sica, came over and played his orchestration that he had done the music for the film. Dominique Sanda, the actress who stars in the film came over. It was a beautiful experience. So I brought my film world and experience to my own, you know, working on opening an art exhibit. We had the foods of New York, the Jewish, so we had the uh, different recipes that Joan Nathan had created from her book as part of the exhibit. It was fantastic. So I was having fun. So your question is my own business, what were the pluses and what were the minuses? You know, I never think of myself, although I do promote women in business, as, you know, I have to be a woman in business. I have to be known as that. I never, I never sort of think of men as being, you know, having put me down in any way or held me back. I think of them as really wonderful advocates of everything I've done personally. Um, I was awarded a business award recently. And um, I was one of the one woman among 10 men. And I did find that awkward because I came to the ceremony and I found myself amongst these 10 men and they were a boys club. And I thought, that's too bad. You know, I'm here too. And I sort of shied away from it. And I sort of thought, are you sure you want to award me this award? And it was for bringing American Italian business to New York. That was what the award was. And I think at times I am overwhelmed with being a woman in business, but I think that it's, you know, something I don't think about. I'm sure that people find me 
you know, overly aggressive or bossy and, you know, they wouldn't find the same if Michael Ovitz was aggressive or bossy. They just think it was wonderful. Um, you know, I say Michael Ovitz because, you know, I'm sort of want to date myself in that way and go back to the old style Hollywood sort of days. But I think that um, it's really important to think of us all as one, you know, men and women, women and men working together. And I've never been told to, you know, back off um, because I was a woman, you know. Um, and I have to say that there there've mostly only been pluses, the minus and misses because sadly of my education, the managing part of it is always tough. But I think that's for anybody. And I can't believe this, but we're already oh, wow. over time. This has been wow. so great. I will say in the chat, somebody says Sally for president, <laughs> which I, I'm all in favor of. I think this was so great. Um, uh, and and I'm giving you this task um, that this will be available on YouTube in a, uh, probably by tomorrow. So we should send the link out because I know there will be a lot more people who will be interested in seeing this too. Somebody just says, thank you, Monica Rossi Miller. I loved your story, Sally. It was so interesting listening to you. I was living all those moments if I'd been there myself. I hope to be able to hear you talk about your life again. So thank you so much. This was so much fun. And um, I'm sorry that I was chatty, Kathy. Oh my God. Well, that's, if you weren't, I'd have to poke you somehow through the internet. <laughs> so thank you. This was really fun. Ciao.